In this video, I'm going to talk through my current 286 system build. I did post a brief video on YouTube just kind of flying through some of what it looks like and maybe some of the output I, I'm getting. In this video, I'm going to kind of slow down a little bit and uh, talk about some of these things. And so if you've been following my video series, there might not be a tremendous amount of new stuff here, but you might still be interested in just kind of seeing this latest layout and latest build that I'm using. And I'll talk through both the hardware aspects and I'll maybe get in uh, to some, some of the aspects on the software side that I, I've been working on. Uh, so let me start out. Here is a picture of my current motherboard populated. So this is my latest PCB and this is version 0 0.50. And I've put some things into this that are handy and I've already changed some things or plan to change some things in the next the next build, which I'm for now labeling version 0 0.60, but we'll see where, where that goes. I might uh, just start by zooming in to the top part of this and just talking through all the pieces here. You know, I've got this processor here, and you can see this is a Harris. It's a Dash 25, so it's an ADC 286-25 in this uh, PLCC format. And around that, I have pull-up resistors for the address and data lines coming off of that. Uh, with that, then, one of the first things I, of course, need is ROM and RAM. So I have my RAM up here, so I have basically a meg of physical memory, although I'm only making 640 kilobytes of it available to the system. And uh, at least for now, I'm wasting the, the rest of it, and maybe I'll change that in the future. And then over to the right, I have my, my flash memory, or my ROMs. And uh, again, same thing. Uh, these, I initially had started out with these uh, chips were uh, 39SF040s. So a pair of those would be a one meg, but I have you know, since trimmed that down to the SF010s. So a pair of these is 256 kilobytes. And that's what I load my ROM on. So processor, RAM, ROM, and then you've got to add latches uh, to this and transceivers. So that's really what you're seeing here. These are my latches and transceivers so that uh, my address lines are latched and any data uh, will go through the transceivers to be uh, sent out to the rest of the system. Uh, something I did put into this uh, build is a clock distribution and it's this uh, chip here. You probably can't read it very well, but it's an 8078. And uh, I think that's the part number 74 FCT 8078. And uh, that has actually proven to be really nice. I, I was a little concerned because I'm coming off of my clock generator chip up here. And I'm coming into this, and then that's distributing it out uh, to 10, 10 different destinations, basically. Now, one challenge, though, is that adds a little bit of delay. And also coming out of this clock generator is a, a peripheral clock, or P-clock. And that I'm just using as is. I don't use it in very many locations. I think I'm only using it in one spot. But I didn't add any delay to that. So technically that is slightly off from this. Uh, but so far that doesn't seem to be an issue. Now as I talk about clock, then I have this 82C284, which is a clock generator. And in this picture you can see I'm running just a slightly over a 16 megahertz crystal going into that so that the speed of the system is 16 megahertz and then the processor internally uses half of that. Um, maybe a real quick comment, as I was building this out, I, I, I've been doing quite a bit of testing on speed and trying to find out where, where things fall apart and at what speeds. And I found that the core of the system, the RAM, the ROM, uh, getting into you know all these uh, transceivers, latches, etc. All of this, I can run the system at 22 megahertz with the processor running at 11, and it runs just fine. What I run into though is as I add a couple of these other chips, you know, specifically I have this uh, programmable peripheral interface, and then I also have a versatile interface adapter. These two chips uh, run into issues along with, uh, down here, my programmable or priority interrupt controller, the PIC. And honestly, out of all of those, it's the PIC that first has issues. And 
you know, I'm doing quite a bit with interrupts at this point, and this, anytime I go above maybe 9 megahertz for the processor clock, or maybe 10, uh, this is what I can tell is having the issues. So I have ordered a faster, instead of a dash 5, I've ordered a dash 12, and I have some of those uh, in route, and I'll see if that allows me to pick up the speed of the system a little bit. But then this VIA up here, it seems about in this 10 to 11 megahertz processor clock or 20 to 22 uh, for the system clock is where it starts to run into issues. And I don't have a faster alternative there, so it, it is what it is. But I'm hoping that if I swap out this pick down here, I'll be able to take this up to for sure a 20 megahertz crystal possibly a 22 megahertz crystal. So we'll see how that testing goes. And most of the stuff I've been demoing, I can actually get it to run completely at a 10 megahertz processor clock for sure and 11 uh, for the most part. But there's a couple of things that start to fall apart and a lot of it I can adjust in my code like things for uh, accessing this real-time clock. I need to add some delays, artificial delays there or increase those delays if I want to run at a faster clock. For now, I'm running anywhere between basically 16 and 20 megahertz for this crystal here and that all is proving to be working just fine. Maybe moving on from that, there's my bus controller. You know, so these are standard Intel type of chips for this, uh, you know, 8286 basic design. So I got my processor, I've got my uh, transceivers, latches, RAM, ROM, and then these clock generator and bus generator chips. You know, the other thing I'm missing is address decoding, and, and I'm doing all of that, or most of that address decoding inside of this PSOC here. And really the way I'm mounting that in is, uh, this question came up on YouTube, but basically this little board is a dev board that you can pick up and uh, I've, you just have to keep your eye out for them when they become available and, and grab some. But uh, these are inexpensive little dev boards, uh, maybe $15 today. They used to be 10 or under $10 when they first were, when I was first buying them. But that little chip on here is this PSOC and I just dropped this entire dev board into a pair of uh, female uh, headers, basically pin headers. So I can pop this out easily, uh, do switch it out, do something different with it, drop it back in, and that's all good. Uh, you probably noticed there are some chips I've taken out of this. I did have them populated. These would have been used for my original PS2 keyboard circuit. And that goes back to the one that Ben Eater showed when he built his uh, PS2 keyboard circuit. And I was using that along with a PPI. Uh, now, Ben, in his video, he would use a VIA for the keyboard, but I, I was using a PPI. I have since moved that, and I'll come back and talk about that later, but I've moved that functionality, and so I don't need these chips for the keyboard. And this, I could repurpose this PPI here for other things. But honestly, I really don't need it because this one here, this first PPI, I'm driving a speaker with it and I'm driving the, the uh, LCD here, the 1602 LCD. But I've got room that I have another port on this and I could use it if I do need something and I've got a header there for that. And if I want something beyond that, I can pop in the other one and I've got a pair of headers for that. And I could also... Uh, in a future version, I will do this. I will take out the connections that go to the uh, PS2 circuit. And then I've just got some, you know, here's a, a 7474, and then I've got a 7414. Um, those are just used for, those are still keyboard related. Um, and actually this, this hex inverter down here is doing inversion for different signals, so I couldn't completely take it out. And I did pull up this pin because I didn't, uh, that actually has to do with an interrupt. and I've moved that, how I'm doing that interrupt, and again, I'll talk about that later. And so I just needed to disconnect that right there. Those are pulled out. Uh, if I maybe take a look at other things that I see uh, here at this point, you know, I do have this nano over here to the right, and that allows me to connect to my PC. And so I can send serial data to the PC uh, for logging, as an example. I can also connect, communicate to this Nano through SPI. So my 286 can communicate uh, through this VIA down here to the Nano through SPI. 
I did add in a pair of 256 kilobyte serial EEPROMs down here. So I have half a megabyte of you know storage basically for user values or other things that don't need fast speed. But if I want to be able to just simply pull pull data or maybe store some stuff, this is available for me. These are really inexpensive, and so I just popped a couple of those on there and accessed them from the Nano. I do have the real-time clock. I mentioned that before. I have this W65C22S. Uh, this is a versatile interface adapter from WDC, and I'm using that for all my SPI functionality. So my processor communicates through it. It's very similar to this PPI over here. It's just a different company, and uh, I had a bunch of existing work I had done with that when it came to SPI, so I, I was just leaning towards reusing that versus using a PPI. Both could get the done, get the same thing done uh, quite easily. Now with that, one of the things I've shown in previous videos is I can connect Arduino Do to my system and download up BIOS updates and flash these BIOS chips, these flash memories, on the fly. The system can actually do it while it's running. So from the operating system, essentially, I can flash, or from the BIOS, if you want to say it that way, I can update the BIOS. And I do that by taking what's in my flash, I copy it to RAM, and then I run from RAM, and while I'm running from RAM, I erase the flashes, pull the data down from an Arduino Do, reprogram them, and then reboot the system. Uh, and that all works great. One of the things I did here, though, is I put in the voltage leveler right on this, this board, so I didn't have an external voltage leveler, because this is all 5 volt, and the Arduino Do is a 3.3 volt. And the reason I'm using the, uh, the Arduino Do is because of its speed with USB super fast. I can transfer data from my computer to that Do uh, faster than any of the other Arduinos that I have. I will say soldering this is trickier. You know, like when I get over here into this clock chip, that's pretty easy to solder as a surface mount, same with these serial EE proms. But this voltage leveler, that physical format, those pins are pretty tight. So I did have to get my microscope out, and I was using that to actually solder those on. I can't just do that without the microscope at this point. Uh, let's see, other things in here then. I have a little, this is just a little, uh, what is it, an LM386 amplifier. So basically I come out of this PPI, I generate, I'll call it a, a square wave audio signal. I can, of course, change uh, the frequency of that. That then goes into this uh, little amplifier, then out to this little speaker. So that's just my post beep or different beeps type of speaker. And as an example, I have put in interrupt handling for a bunch of the errors that could happen on the system. And when those errors happen, I do play different tones uh, to get my attention that something fell apart. And that has been really handy. That along with, I have a header up here that goes out to, uh, it's, a, it's a little OLED screen. That OLED screen, I can write to it by communicating through my Nano. So I can write an SPI request to the Nano. The Nano then writes to the screen. But like all my post boot up statuses, I write out to that screen. That's really helpful. And then, of course, I've got this 1602 that I can write out stuff to through uh, this PPI over here. And that's also helpful. So between... You know, the, the little debug screen up above, which I'll show later, along with this 1602 plus this speaker, it gives me a lot of uh, feedback if something isn't working right, along with, of course, serial output that I can send here over to a serial window on my PC. Uh, maybe other things to point out here as far as connections. I My favorite connection for power is still banana jacks, so I have a pair of banana jacks here. I think those are great. They work well. I also have a connector that I can either put a screw terminal or a quick connect type of connector. I have a, a DC barrel type connector if I want to use that for power. You know, they're all tied into the same VCC and ground, so I can choose how I want to use those. I have a keyboard connector for PS2. I have a mouse connector for PS2. I put a USB connector in here. All it's doing is connecting the lines into the PS2 uh, mouse. So it's intended for me to plug in a USB mouse, have that mouse go into PS2 fallback mode, and then that's how I treat it. Um, maybe that's confusing to someone else that might think it's a regular USB port, but this is my board. I, I know that 
exactly what that port is for. I'm not going to try to accidentally plug in some other USB device. And if I did, I just simply wouldn't do anything. I do have a chip down here that does the delayed uh, startup of the system. So when I turn on the system, it does hold the processor, the reset active uh, just for a, a small amount of time and then lets it come back up. And then that also does watch for voltage levels. And if they drop, then it does automatically do a reset of the system too. The other thing that it does is it does look for a constant uh, pulse from something. And if it loses that constant pulse, it has a watchdog. And then that watchdog will reset the system. And for now, what I did on the system is I just have two little pins here to places I can solder in or connect what I want that watchdog signal strobe coming from. And on the back side of the board, I just simply soldered into one of these and then I tapped into, I think it was one of my clock signals. So I just found a nearby clock signal and tapped it into that. Um, if I later I wanna tap that into something else, I could do that, but I just need a constant signal uh, being sent to that. And if that signal stops, as far as you know, up and down signal levels, then uh, this chip resets the system. Uh, maybe real quick on the oscillator, I did put in a little socket here so I can pull that and drop a new one in. There's no soldering needed to do that. I did, uh, as far as the processor, I've got you know caps uh, surrounding it. Uh, both uh, this is a, I, I think this was a 100 microfarad. So I've got a pair of 100s and then I've got a 0.1 and a 0.01 microfarad really by where the power pins are on this on the two sides. And of course I've got a bunch of pull-ups and I did decrease those values. So if you go look at the data sheet for the processor, there's a range of values and they suggest lowering the, the resistance as you increase the speed. So I did drop those down a little bit in this version of the build. I have a little adjustment. This is also legacy now. Uh, this allowed me to adjust some resistance as part of my old PS2 keyboard circuit. So in my next revision, I'm probably going to take out a couple of these chips. I'm going to take that out and then I'll decide if I want to keep this extra PPI in there or not. Uh, for the clock lines, every outbound clock line has a 10 ohm inline resistor. And let's see if I'm missing anything else up here. I guess I do have pin headers up here for all my address data and some of the control signals. So if I want to tap in some other type of debugger or just have quick probe spots to touch to, I can do that. I do have a header for an eight character seven segment display that I, I had used way back when, which I really don't intend to use that again. And then I have this OLED connector. This is an I2C connection that goes back to this nano. And then I did put in ATX, and this is the, the one issue I found with this board. This power connection, I don't know why it's so hard, but um, when, I, when I found a footprint for this, or I found a component in this in Easy EDA, uh, it basically was the opposite of what it was labeled, male versus female. And I think people get confused. The pins inside the connectors are kind of the opposite of what the connector as a whole is. So it's, to me, what is a male connector. Inside of the male connector, there are female connecting pins. But anyways, what I had expected for pin out on this, I obviously didn't check it enough when I was putting this together. Uh, the pins that I was expecting to be over here, for example, were over here. And it was essentially the opposite gender of the connector that I had used, which makes no sense for a PCB mounted one. It's backwards. It was more of the cable end of the connector, not the PCB side. But I corrected that. So on the next spin of this, uh, this will be uh, a proper ATX power connector. I don't know if I'm going to honestly use it though. Uh, one of the things with ATX, as I understand it, is that five volt is always on and I don't necessarily want that. You know, this switch will let me take and turn on the 12 volt. Um, but I don't use 12 volt in my system. So questionable if, if there's a good benefit to using ATX power here or not. Or I would want a power supply that had a switch on it so I could turn it off there. Then I've got a reset switch for the reset of the system. Basically that drops a line down on this reset over here. So then as I maybe scroll down on this a little bit, I think I've pretty much covered most everything that's up here on the top. Uh, as I do come down, you know, I do have 
uh, a header to connect my do so that I can do that uh, programming of the flash ROM. Along with that, I did put in some extra power and ground connectors for other SPI devices. And of course, I have additional pins because with this VIA, I may be using, what was it, four, maybe five SPI devices. So I, I can connect quite a few more devices here if I want to. I then have my my math coprocessor, so here's a 287. I do have a jumper that lets me choose whether the clock of that is the full speed or a half speed, um, basically is, is how it works. Uh, and I'd have to go back to the details on that in the video uh, way back when, when I posted on that. But essentially this is allowing me to cut that clock speed internally in half. And I do have it running at half at the half speed um, because as I've been going up to uh, 20, 22 megahertz for the system, uh, that definitely is required because this just can't keep up at those speeds. Of course, I've got a bunch of ISA slots to the left and I'm pretty much, there's a couple, maybe a couple signals that I'm not sending and I'm not messing around with any of the 12 volt or anything like that on the system. But I do have all of these ISA slots really following the standard, uh, so I've got most of the signals that I need there. Almost all of the signals, again, like I said, minus a, a couple that really aren't too important for what I'm doing. I did build into this version a DMA controller. I have not tested it, I've not tried to code to it, and so it's connected the way I think it should be connected based on reading, but uh, we'll see as I get into that if that's actually going to work or not. I do have my priority interrupt controller here, and then I did add in support for a cascaded or a secondary uh, pick that I can use there. And then I just got header pins, so as I add in new devices, I can just tap into those appropriate interrupts. And those interrupts are already tapped into the ISA bus too. So you know, basically, if I come up with new things I want to do, uh, I can get the signals routed wherever I want with some really easy uh, little jumper wires. I am doing a pull-up on all of the address and bus signals, and right now I think this is a 1K pull-up, and I believe, if I remember right, these are at 1K or maybe 3.3K. I think I have most everything at 1K right now for pull-ups. I have an SD card reader down here. I have this Nano, and what it's doing is all the keyboard and mouse. So a PS2 keyboard and mouse, all those signals come down here. This has two pins, and Nano only has two pins that can actually be uh, generating interrupts based on you know signals changing on those pins. And so I'm using both of those, one for a keyboard, one for a mouse. And then I have the four lines for the other uh, data, pair of data lines for keyboard and mouse. And then the way that I'm fetching that data is I'll throw one of the two interrupts. So this is connecting over here for two different interrupts, one for the mouse, one for the keyboard. And when the interrupt is generated from the 286, then I make an SPI call through the VIA down to the Nano and I retrieve all the keyboard and mouse data. So whether it's a keyboard interrupt or a mouse interrupt, I retrieve everything and uh, that's five bytes of data. So I quickly retrieve five bytes of data through an SPI call. And then I can update, of course, the mouse and or keyboard depending on what the situation is. And that is working really well, and I'll maybe get into that in more detail later, but that keyboard mouse implementation is the best I've ever had. Uh, switching from this old legacy design to this down here, it's so smooth and I have much, much better access and it's much easier to implement. So now I don't have to, on my 286, be tracking when someone presses down on a, on a shift or up on a shift or alt or function keys or all these other situations. Now what happens is I can retrieve a single word of data from the Nano that tells me anything and everything I need to know about what's going on on the keyboard. And I don't have to do that tracking myself. It's all done within the code on the Nano. So as far as the overall efficiency of my system, it's actually quite a bit more efficient, even though you might say, wow, five, I have to transfer five bytes of data through SPI every time I hit a key or move the mouse. Uh, yes, that's true, but overall I'm finding that it's actually better. You will see that throughout this, you know, I do have, of course, all of these uh, holes are placed based on the ATX form factor. This order overall fits the ATX form factor. 
So that's all worked out well. It's fit into a standard ATX chassis that I'm using, which is just kind of a, an open frame type of chassis, uh, which is great for this type of stuff because I want to get to all, all of the board and, and pop things in and out as I go through this. Uh, I do have supplemental power connections. So if at some point I build a car that just needs more power, then it's going to be able to effectively pull through my, my bus here. I can tap into any one of these. Although at this point, you know, I got power coming in, I have filled the top with, I think I got the top with a VCC and the bottom filled copper with ground. Uh, between that, I'm getting great voltage distribution uh, across my entire board and both of those add-in cards. So I have zero concerns with power at the moment, but they're there just in case I do need something better later. So I think that's it. If I missed something on here and you're curious, well, what was that thing? Just let me know. But that's pretty much this board. So then that might get me to, you know, what does this look like after I put it into the system? You know, and that's looking like this. So what I've done is I've plugged in the VGA card into the closest slot. And honestly, I put the, I started with the VGA card in the furthest slot just to see if it made much of a difference. And I I couldn't notice any difference. I didn't make it run, you know, it didn't change my limits as or ceilings as far as speeds. So it seems like slots not really making a big difference. And remember with the clock, I'm running, I, I have a separate clock signal for every single slot. So if I plug this in here, it's not going to mess up the clock for another card or vice versa. And it also isolates it from the core, what the processor needs for the clock. Uh, so that was a nice uh, upgrade in this design. But I've got my video card here, and then I have my sound card down here. And uh, I don't, again, think it's going to matter where I place them. And I was happily surprised. I uh, These cards, if you've looked at my design for those before, I go down pretty low uh, after the edge of the slot. I actually bring the PCB down a little bit. And I thought I would run into these chips. So I tried to space things so that I could, you know, get a card right in between some of these ICs. But it ends up that I can get this in and fully seated and just be above the IC underneath it. And that's with that IC being in a socket. So it, that all worked out um, a little bit lucky on my side because I wasn't planning for that to work out, but it did. And then if I look at the back, you know, after this is all put together, you know, I get something that looks like this. And you can see my very professional uh, metalwork over here. Uh, basically, it ends up that the component I used for the VGA, this uh, DB15 connector, was supposed to be a wider or longer, if I want to say it that way. It was supposed to come out further from where it was. Uh, but this is a component I had on hand. I had just desoldered this off of some old... Um, you know, basically decommissioned equipment. So I had pulled this off and uh, it was a shorter version and it didn't quite come out far enough, which no big deal. I just simply opened up this metal bracket a little bit. So it doesn't look great, but once you actually get it connected, you don't see that anyways. Um, and then of course over here, I had to drill a little hole. These brackets, uh, these are kind of a standard bracket. And if you go back to the design I have for any of my cards, I actually have holes placed on those cards, you know, in very specific locations. And then I also mark what's the bracket part number uh, that's going to work at those positions. So I have a batch of these, a very specific sized, basically, uh, slot covers and they have and maybe actually if I go back you can maybe see that a little bit on one of these other ones Like here you can see that uh, that bracket comes down It has the two little legs that come off of it and then from there to my card I just use a little spacer and basically that screws in and on the back side of the card that screws into that little spacer and that all works out fine. I'm sure there are better mounting mechanisms. In other words, uh, these brackets that would come on the other side of the bracket as far as where they connect to the PCB, so I wouldn't need the spacers. But I just haven't found availability or the right ones, I guess, as I've been looking. But that's all plugged in. You can see I then put in this OLED screen down here. It has a, a little uh, connector that goes into uh, this pin header and then connects to a pin header on, on the bottom side of this. And again, that's an I2C based screen that is is controlled with this nano. 
and going back then to this. So I've got my video, I've got my audio, and then of course i um, got my power, and then I'm gonna use this for my keyboard and this for my mouse. And that's it. I, I didn't populate these other ones because I don't know if I'll ever use them. And you'll see that I left a lot of other things unpopulated back on the motherboard just because I I'm not going to use this, so I know I'm not going to use it on this version because that's wrong, the ATX, but these pin headers, I'm not going to even fill them in. This picture, you can't see it, but all around my PSOC little board here, there's pin headers. I've got pin headers all over here for extra ports. Uh, the only ones I really filled in was the SPI because I knew I would probably be using those. I do have to fill in the do connector yet. I have not done that. Um, and I've technically not tested that yet, uh, so there is a small chance that I could have an issue with that when it comes to, you know, the soldering of this chip or something like that. But that's a pretty simple design, so I'm not too worried that the design is wrong, but I could have messed up the soldering. I think I'm pretty good on it, but... So I think that's it on the hardware side of things. And like I said, if, if I miss anything and you're curious, just, just ask. And I can uh, go back and answer questions on my YouTube channel or my blog if you've got any questions there. Maybe what I could do is jump into my code update for a second. Uh, maybe a couple of things I could show is I do have... Uh, let me open up this project here. So this is the code for the little nano that sits in the lower left of my board and it's doing all the keyboard and mouse so basically I come in and I've got my mouse connected to pins uh, 3, 4, and 5 well 3 and 4 digital and then analog 5 and then my keyboard I've connected to uh, 2, 6, and analog 3 so the analog I'm using to actually generate the interrupt over to my priority interrupt controller and then 4, 3, and 6, 2 I'm using to basically tap into the positive minus signal on the PS2 or USB PS2 adapter. And then from there, for the most part, uh, I've, I've added in an interrupt that is an SPI interrupt. So anytime my 286 communicates with that nano, it's going to send a, basically a request through SPI to fetch back five packets of data. And this is just some simple logic that grabs me my keyboard data and gets it sent out. And then it also grabs me my uh, data for my mouse. So there's three bytes of data for the mouse, and then there are two bytes of data for the keyboard. So five bytes gives me everything. And then I've got the rest of this. I've got a loop, and uh, basically in the loop, you know, I'm checking for keyboard input, and if there is keyboard input, I can uh, massage that data however I want and then get it prepared and put into a variable that that other interrupt will read. And then same with the mouse. I'm, I can basically come in here and just check, has the mouse data moved? And if so, put it into this variable so that that interrupt service routine will send it out anytime that an SPI call is made to this. And that SPI call is made anytime that I actually trigger the interrupt. And, and make, make sure I'm clear on that. From my Nano, I interrupt the 286. The 286 then makes an SPI call back to the Nano to actually fetch the data. So there's an interrupt from the Nano to the 286, and then there's another interrupt when the 286 makes an SPI call back to the Nano. Uh, but that allows me to just quickly notify the 286, and then when it gets around to it, it can come get the latest mouse and keyboard data. And that all is working great. And if I go up top, you know, the, the libraries that I'm using, I'm using SPI, Wire, and then I had found this uh, PS2 key advanced, and it looks like this is the URL that I put in here, this uh, techpal slash PS2 key advanced. And I, I kind of simplified that or trimmed it down and really just pulled out some of the parts of it that I need. But uh, that is a really nice uh, PS2 keyboard library if, if you're looking for something there. So that is it on the mouse side of things and the keyboard side of things. If I go to my, my 286 code, the way that I'm still working with this is I have my main assembly file that I'm working in. And I'll zoom in a little bit. And when this starts up, it's going to do all kinds of initializing and setting up interrupts and things like that. You know, I did add some new interrupts uh, recently. So if I go down to this setup interrupts, I added a a mouse services interrupt, interrupt 31. So I have 10, which is basically my video services. DOS services is interrupt 21. 
and then mouse services is interrupt 30, 31. And the only thing I've put into that so far is show cursor, show mouse pointer, mouse cursor, or hide the mouse pointer, basically. I come through, I do all my different setups, and uh, then I, I basically jump into a main loop and you know, just kind of have it sit and spin, checking for, is there new keyboard data? That is something, though, that as I made the switch from the PS2 legacy keyboard circuit to the Nano, I, I really had to go back and refactor all my code for how the keyboard is handled. So instead of pulling it basically from the, the, the shifting coming in from this old PS2 circuit, I'm pulling it through an SPI call. But it simplified things so much that I wasn't tracking near as much stuff. All I had to do was make an SPI call and fetch the latest data. Uh, so, you know, all of that uh, has been improved and kind of reworked. So I do have things like a keyboard initialization routine. I do have a mouse ISR. So that's anytime that the mouse moves. So if I move the mouse, this interrupt gets raised. And then all I do is I make an SPI call that's to that nano that says, get me the keyboard mouse data. And then I draw the mouse pointer unless the mouse is currently not enabled if it's not visible then i just get out of this procedure so that's how i'm just handling that that's pretty easy and then i added this mouse services so i can show or hide and it's just setting a flag that this other routine then can pay attention to you know i have things like a keyboard handler of course and so then i can come down and look at the keyboard same thing if a keyboard interrupt is raised i just go fetch the keyboard mouse data and for now or at least for a little while, I'm, every time I hit a key, I show it on my LCD just so I, I know exactly what data came through. And the way that this is set up, the data that comes through, the low byte is typically which character, and then the upper byte tells me if I have the shift or alt or control or other things um, set when that key is hit. So I have really good control now of knowing what key whether it's ascii or not ascii so all the fun any key on the keyboard uh, i i know this is the key and then i know if any of the other modifier keys are also set and so that that's all working great and so like in this case i go out and i grab it and then i place it into a buffer and then that's it i stop and there's no more interrupt work but then on my main loop i check if there is stuff in there then i wrote this process keyboard buffer and so then I would have a different procedure in here to process that keyboard buffer. And that would look something like this. You know, so that's where I've got to go out and read from that buffer and then do something with it. And that's where I, I pull out uh, two bytes. So I pull out a full word of data because like I was talking before, there are two bytes that now describe anytime I hit a key. And I just check for certain keys and do certain things, or I get down and say it's ASCII and what to do with it if it's ASCII. And here then I'm using one of my lower level interrupts to actually write out characters if you did hit a key. I guess I'll post the latest code if you want to dig through this. And again, I am learning a great deal and I'm actually starting to get a bit comfortable with assembly there so i'm i'm to the point that i'm not confused all the time and and just simply building on what i have been learning and getting tips from from a lot of you on again probably not wonderful code but it's working and every time i go back and look at my older code i realize i can improve it so um, that's a good thing that means i'm learning stuff I do still have a C code that I can compile and build, and this was a simple sample, but then I got into uh, C++, and I did now make a command file, so command.com is what this will get built as, and this is doing uh, what you might have seen in the last video or a previous video where I bring up you know, a, an ROS and I, and I say a blue border around the entire screen and I have the little sprite you know, walk across the screen and then I ask for input. I, I basically read keyboard input and then I write something back out based on that input and then I get out. And so if I go down, maybe I'll just skip through some of these, you know, things like I can use printf to write out to my screen. I can swap the frames on my video card because it has two frame buffers so I can write to the non-active one and then swap it and make it active. I can clear my screen. 
you know, I can set up print char options and I have one option that tells it that when I write a character, does it write to both frames or only one frame? And then I have procedures now, you know, draw rectangles and set cursor positions and things like that. And if I want to read from uh, the user, I can come in here and now do things like F gets and read input from the user. And that's what you've seen in, in the video, the last video, for example, where I, I asked, you know, what's your favorite color? And I typed in yellow as an example. And I have support to do delays and that leverages the real time clock to do that. And so this at some point, I'm going to gut a lot of what's in here and this will simply be like a DOS command com. So this is what's going to be actually looking for input and trying to determine what program, where to load it, how to load it, pull things off of my IDE storage, etc. So then I started working on a win.com. And so here's, you know, where I'm going to get into that. And, you know, this again, I'm just starting to build this up. But if you saw the last video, you know, I, I come in and I maybe draw my start bar. I draw a start button. I put a cursor. Uh, basically, I set my position for I want to, where I want to write text into that button. And I write out the word start. And then I put a sprite in the middle of the screen just to have something in the background. I swap frames and I repeat that uh, just so that either frame, if I'm typing for example and it's bouncing between frames quickly, uh, it doesn't flicker or flash or anything weird like that. Uh, and then I say show mouse and those things like show mouse are going to make an interrupt call and in this case there's that call to interrupt 31 that's going to make my mouse visible. And then at that point my, my 286 will actually start processing mouse input. A lot of uh, really basic stuff there, but it's let me start to build up, you know, some type of a graphical user interface as I move forward. Uh, so maybe if I think about next steps, what do I have to do here? I have started thinking through maybe next steps a little bit. And the next uh, few things for sure I need to do is I need to get my IDE support working. So I do have a PCB in-house now that should let me plug it into an ISA slot and connect to a little CF card that I have so that I can use that CF card to read and write and, you know, persist stuff other than using flash or some other storage mechanism or SD card. And I think I have what I need there from a low level assembly to get me just the raw access to the CF card. And then the actual file system functionality, I'm probably going to put in via C++. Uh, so I've got some work there to implement a basic FAT file system in C++. But I think there's plenty of samples out there, and I think I can work my way through that. Uh, I have more interrupts that I need to keep adding. So basically the way I'm approaching this is every time I do something in C++ that calls an interrupt that I don't have support for, it throws a message, beeps at me, and, and logs out the detail of what got asked for that I don't have support for. So I'll implement those kind of as I need them, uh, or as time permits. If I know I'm going to need it at some point, there's a long list that I am working on. I'm going to continue to work on this win.com and a graphical user interface. You know, I do have it now that I can move my mouse and as I move the mouse pointer and, it, and it's going over video memory, it's actually first copying out that tiny little bit of video memory so that I can restore it. So, uh, you know, as I, as the mouse cursor goes into a location, I copy that location to another location draw the mouse cursor on it, and then after the mouse cursor leaves it, I restore it back to what it was. And that's constantly happening as I move the mouse around. I don't have hardware, sprite, hardware sprite support, so I've got to do all of this through basically software. Uh, but that's all working fine. But I want to keep building out that interface. And the next thing I need to work on is clicking so that I can click the start button and ha actually have it pull up in a menu. And then as I click a choice in the menu, have it actually run that maybe a separate uh, 64k com file as an example uh, so i'll be working on that i think what with that one of the things i have to do is figure out how do i dynamically change and interrupt to point to something within the com file and i think i, I have an idea how to do that i'm already doing some remapping uh, today of interrupts to point to different interrupts for example when i run my command.com I can change uh, interrupts. And actually, in that case, I'm changing the normal keyboard interrupt to an alternate interrupt so that when I say read 
from the console a line, I'm fetching that through a different interrupt than the normal one. And then at the end of it, I put it back to where it was. So that type of stuff, uh, switching the interrupts on the fly, I think I can manage that interrupt vector table work. But then it's just making sure that I know how to point to the right address that's inside of the com file uh, at whatever address it gets loaded at. Those types of things I have to work through. I am going to get to DMA support at some point. You know, like I said earlier, I've got it in my circuit. It just needs to be tested, and I need to figure out uh, all the coding that goes with uh, DMA. But I don't have any hardware that can leverage DMA yet. And I don't think the CF cards are going to get me there, but uh, at some point I should hopefully have some type of ISA card that has some DMA uh, capability or, or requirement, and then I can start playing with DMA. I wouldn't mind adding some TCP IP support at some point. I have some ideas. I'll probably offload that to some, some little type of um, separate little circuit. Uh, so I'm not going to try to make my 286 actually do TCP IP manipulation, but maybe it can make an SPI call. And I've seen some pretty interesting little SPI to TCP IP PHY type devices. So maybe there's something I can do there that uh, will offload some of that work for me. Don't know what I'll do with TCP IP, but I thought that'd be kind of fun to see if I could ping a local device on the network or something like that. And I am still working towards getting DOS running, uh, whether it's Microsoft DOS or some other flavor. And I'm basically just incrementally working through adding BIOS interrupts. And that just takes a lot of time. And that will take weeks and months, uh, not weeks. It'll take months and months, if not quarters, to really work through all that. But I'm just chipping away at it. And as time permits, I'll, I'll, I'll finish out those interrupts to hopefully get to where I can load up and run DOS. And we'll have to see what other things I need along the way. Uh, someone suggested, you know, making sure my video card can have the right uh, emulation or support the right type of, you know, what DOS is going to be expecting or DOS, some DOS apps might expect out of my video card. And um, being my video card is not real standard, I'm sure I'll, I'm going to learn some stuff as I go through that. And maybe at some point I'll come back and see if I can get protected virtual address mode working. Uh, right now I'm doing everything in real mode. I've got this one meg limitation to my address space. You know, it'd be nice to, to see if I could get protected virtual address mode working, but I think that's going to be a heavy development lift. Not impossible, but it's just going to take some effort, I think. So we'll see how that goes. You know, this is where I really wish I had a 16 meg flat memory space and didn't have to deal with the 64K segmentation, but I'm on a 286, so it is what it is, and I'll just have to learn how to work with that. Uh, so those, I think, are the big things. You know, I might have some small things along the way, like uh, putting in a little joystick controller. You know, that stuff's all going to be pretty simple to do. Uh, if any of you have feedback on other things that you think I really should be considering, hardware or software, BIOS, whatever, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of kind of keep chipping away in this uh, general direction and uh, seeing if I can, you know, make things a little, a little bit more functional in the uh, months to come. But I think if I can get storage going, that's going to be a big step. And then it's just a lot of coding maybe in C++ to see what all I can do on the system and to really start to test the performance. You know, I don't have hardware sprites, so software sprites are, are going to limit the performance of the video card. Uh, and I might choose to spin a new version of the video card that adds something for hardware support, whether it's hardware scrolling, hardware sprites, hardware characters. I don't know. We'll see. Let's see what uh, the future brings here. For now, I'm going to see how far I can go without spinning any new PCBs, either for the motherboard or sound card or video card, because I think they're all at a at a reasonably workable state at this point. So I'm just going to see what can I do with them uh, without doing anything significant as far as design change. Appreciate everybody uh, following and all the, the feedback uh, that I get from everybody and the, and the uh, guidance. So uh, as always, thanks for watching and uh, more to come. Mm -hmm.